searching for answers that aren't here to find. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. This is the on time crew. Woohoo! I see ya. I am feeling so thankful to be here. Hi, Schroeders. <laughs> Can we just open in a word of prayer? And then we're going to worship together. You guys are lucky because you're here on time. You get maximum worship time. I see lots of smiles about that. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning just ready to meet with you, eager to meet with you, to quiet our hearts, to look out at the waves, and to just breathe in your spirit that is alive and with us as we walk through our day. I pray that we would hear from you this morning, Lord. That you would stir in our hearts and speak a word of life and encouragement. You know what each of us need. You see us. You know the thoughts in our mind. You go before and behind us, Lord. So we just anticipate now having a moment with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Sorry, guys, having a little bit of a malfunction here. All right, there we go. You are good. 
sorrow comes When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in
Thank you that you are Lord of all. I thank you that this morning we can just lay our burdens at your feet. We can bring our joys to you. You are with us, Lord. We acknowledge your presence this morning as we look out over your beauty. We welcome you and we humble ourselves in our hearts before you. Thank you, amen. You can have a seat. I'm so happy you're here. My name is Brooke and I am part of the staff team at here at the River Church. And um, you know, it's so funny. I. James and Bray and George and I and our families had dinner this week and we were talking about the river and we were dreaming about the river in this church. And, you know, one of the things that we, we talked about is when we're doing ministry other places and we talk about this church, when we talk about you, it's always about people. It's always about the relationships. And um, sometimes people come and visit and they'll be like, oh, is is this the River Church? And we say, yeah, look around. This is the River Church. It's us. It's you. And that is what is so good about it. So we just want to welcome you, if this is your first time, to the most insanely authentic, loving, Christ-like relationships that you've ever experienced in your life, hopefully. 
And um, I just want to take a moment and just give you an opportunity to say hi, to connect on that note, um, just to look somebody in the eyes, maybe take off your sunglasses and, and give them a good, warm river welcome. OK? Just a couple minutes? Thanks. Really, really exciting things to share. And I don't want you to miss it, Heather. I know you're eager and ready. <laughs> Just kidding. So I'll wait one second. How's everybody doing? Good? It's a good Sunday morning. Got a little cozy setup back there with your coffee. Nice. Um, two things that I wanted to mention this morning before I welcome Bill up to bring us to the word. Next weekend, July 31st, is that next weekend? We are having an all beach service. Woohoo! Our first and only of the summer. This does not affect you. But just in case, that is the week that you were thinking you would try the Catalina Room. Please don't because no one will be there. We will all be here. We will be welcoming all of our river kids and kids' friends uh, home from summer camp. And this morning, we sent them off on a bus, on lots of buses. D uh, would you just raise your hand if you sent kids to Hume? Dwight is a happy man sitting back there. Woohoo! we got a couple. Anybody over here? Nice, okay. So we have lots of our students who are up at Hume Lake this week. We just want to pray over them. Would you join me in praying that they would experience the Lord this week, that it would be a powerful week for them to just have fun and be kids and be silly and do all the costume things and eat all the milkshakes and have an encounter with the living God. That would be so rad, right? So that's where they're going to be this week. We will pray over them. I'm going to even pray over them in a minute. Next week, we will celebrate their return. It's going to be a huge service with lots of energy. We're going to have baptisms for our students. And if you yourself would like to get baptized, there's also an opportunity for you. So there's a, um, an email address, and I don't know what it is, that you're supposed to. Info at riversouthbay.org. Info at riversouthbay.org if you would also like to get baptized. And if it's a spur-of-the-moment decision, I don't know. Maybe you can talk to a pastor next week, and we'll see. Um, on the note of Hume Lake, ladies, there is an opportunity for you to go to Hume Lake. We send our kids every single year, and it is the highlight of their life. They just love it, and we keep going back. And you guys know it's competitive to get your kids into Hume Lake because it's the week. It's where you want to be this week. We have an opportunity for you to go. There is a Our River Fall Women's Retreat will be at Hume Lake this year, which is so fun. There is a, a QR code on the little handout that you got this morning, and you can actually register right now. So we are so excited to gather a group, to head up there, to encounter the Lord for ourselves. It's just the most beautiful place in the world. I'm going to be co-teaching with one of my best friends, Megan Fate Marshman, and a couple other women. There's going to be a panel with just lots of diverse teachers, and it's going to be really, really powerful. So Get it on your calendar right now because you're not going to believe it. Fall just like sneaks up, you know? You think like we're in the middle of the summer. I don't have to think about that yet. And then the next thing you know, here we are. You're going to have missed Hume. So get it on your calendar. Register. Bring some friends. Ask people if they want to be in a cabin with you, and we'll make it happen. Bill, can you come up for... This is, can everyone just give Bill a little round, <laughs> round of applause? Woo! We're so thankful to have you, Bill. I want to pray over Bill and his message this morning, and I'm just going to pray over also our students who we sent off. So, Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the counselors and the volunteers 
who are going with rowdy teenagers to camp for a week, who are sleeping in wagons and sacrificing their sleep. (laughs) But also, Lord, um, who are serving in that they are leading students all week long to you, that they're pointing them to you, they are counseling them, they are directing, directing them to, to your feet, to your heart. They are navigating hard conversations and hard questions. And so I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just come upon our counselors and leaders and staff who are driving to Hume Lake right now. We just ask that your Spirit would come upon them. Give them wisdom and patience that they would just be overflowing with love for these students all week long, all the way until the bus ride home, through the bus ride home. (laughs) And we pray over these kids, Lord, that they would have an encounter with you, that their hearts would be changed, and that it would lead to changed and transformed lives. We know that only you and your spirit has the power to do that. And so we just intercede and we just get on our knees this week and join them, join each other in prayer over the next generation, Lord, that they would know you and choose you for themselves. And Father, I also pray over Bill this morning as he brings us your word. Father, would you speak through him? Would we be able to settle and still the worrying thoughts in our mind in order to hear your voice? And would your word just come alive? We love you. We thank you for this Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Amen, Brooke. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, those at home. I have a premise for my message this morning. I'm just going to give it to you right up top before we get into the parable. And that is this. Jesus is speaking. Because he is the word of God made flesh. But in our really noisy world, it's possible that we can't hear him. In fact, it's possible that we're not even listening. Think of the noise that enters our ear, our, our eyes and our ears today. This Think with me for a moment, the inboxes in your life. Think with me for a moment, the channels of the messages that come your way today. Whether it's uh, an email inbox for work and for home, whether it's a physical inbox at home where the papers go that you have to process, Whether it's your social media messages that you need to deal with, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or wherever it happens to be, even that annoying little app that Facebook has called Messenger. Like, you open Messenger and you discover that there's a message that was there six months ago. Like, there's so many ways that people can get in touch with us now, let alone voicemail, let alone text messages. All the ways that we have to check to find out how people are connecting with us. And of course, there's videos to watch. There's uh, Netflix to watch. Um, Sometimes it can feel like we're inundated with so many ways that we have to keep up with connecting one another. You think about all the information and the data that is coming our way today. It's, it's sometimes overwhelming when you think about it. In fact, I did a little research, and I can't get the statistics completely accurate, but I know I'm pretty close to being spot on, and that is that we're exposed to about 74 gigabytes of information every single day. And if you go back 500 years ago, the average person was, uh, was confronted with 74 gigabytes of information in their entire lifetime. It's a dramatic change 
in terms of the ocean of data and information that we have access to and that we're exposed to. And so therefore, we have to do selective listening. We just can't pay attention to all of it. So we turn a lot off. In fact, we filter out the unimportant, or what we think is the un unimportant. We, we just, we cast it aside. We push it away from ourselves. We're forced to dump information. And you know, uh, neurologists and sleep experts will tell us that we need to turn off all our screens an hour before we go to bed. You do that, right? I don't. You know, we're supposed to turn off all the screens an hour before we go to bed because our brains need the overnight while we sleep to process that information and to connect the dots. But oftentimes, the screen is the last thing we look at and the first thing we look at surrounding our, our sleep. There's a famous book called The Seven Laws of Teaching, written by John Milton Gregory. He wrote this book in 1886. He said, the striking clock may sound in the ear, and the passing object may paint its image in the eye, but the inattentive mind neither hears nor sees. Who has not read a whole page with the eyes, and at the bottom found himself unable to recall a single idea that it contained? The senses had done their work, but the mind had been busy with other thoughts. We are so easily distracted, partly because of the massive amounts of information that we're confronted with every single day. In one day, we generate 500 million tweets, 294 billion emails, 4 million gigabytes of Facebook data. In one day, in one day, there's 720 100,000 new content added to, uh, uh, on YouTube. I got mixed up. 720,000 new hours of, and some of you are trying to watch all of it. Every minute, Snapchat users share 527,000 photos, and there's more than 1 billion TikTok videos viewed every single day. It's just a mass, a mass of data and information that we've been confronted with. And, and that's just digital information. When you think about all the, the relational cues that we have to process when we walk through our day as we relate to one another, and all the physical sensations that we need to navigate with our bodies just to make it through each day. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this back right after World War II. He said, but he who can no longer listen to his brother will soon be no longer listening to God either. The data that we're confronted with and we consume today has significance in that it affects not only our minds, but it impacts our souls. So that sets up this parable that Jesus tells. It's in Mark chapter 4. I'm going to read it to you the way that the original hearers heard it as well. We call it the parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4. And we've been in this series on the parables, stories from another world. We're looking at various parables that Jesus told his disciples because they give us an insight into what life in the kingdom can be like. Jesus is uh, piquing our interest and in getting us to contemplate what it might look like to follow him as the king. The parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. And then Mark says this, he taught the many things by parables, and in his teaching, he said, and here's the parable of the sower, and he's going to talk about four different kinds of dirt, helping us think through what kind of dirt we might happen to be. He starts, Jesus starts by saying, listen, and there's actually two words here in the original language. So Jesus is shouting out at the crowd, hey, I want you to listen. Stop what you're doing and listen. 
He says the same thing to us today. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. The path was next to the, to, to the field, and the sower is a prodigal sower, and he's casting out the seed, and the farmers would, would walk on the, on the edge of the field, and some of the seed goes over there onto that hard path, and the birds come and eat it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. And the fourth, still other seed, fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. End of the parable. Jesus said then to the crowd, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He bookended the parable with, hey, everyone, listen up. And then he says, if you've got some ears, make sure you're really hearing. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked Jesus about the parables. They were confused. They wanted clarification. They were curious a really important aspect to learning and hearing the words of Jesus is having curiosity. And then Jesus says this strange thing. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, my disciples, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that, and then he quotes from the book of Isaiah. In other words, what Jesus is saying is my sermon to you is intentionally confusing. Now, none of us that teach on the teaching team ever want to come up here and intentionally be overly confusing so you walk away scratching your heads going, I don't get it. That, 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 that feels like death to us as teachers. But Jesus was intentional about masking. He goes on to say from Isaiah chapter 9, so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Remember what John Milton Gregory said, you know, we, we have eyes, we have ears, we read a whole page from a book, we get an image in our mind, we hear something with our ears and it never connects. It just passes by. We drive drive our car, and then we realize for the last two hours, we don't remember anything about what we saw while we drove. Because we're forced to just shove off information as fast as we can. And Jesus says that's, that's key to listening. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. The disciples were unique because they were curious And they came to Jesus and they said, we want you to tell us more. Tell us more. We want to understand. So then Jesus said to the disciples, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? In other words, the parable of the sower is a parable about parables. It's a parable about listening and hearing and understanding. And we're kind of halfway through our summer series on the parables. And so I'm stopping right now to ask, what are you hearing? When you think about the last few weeks and the messages that have been brought. I mean, let, let's be honest. If you probably thought through the last few weeks, you might go, mm, I'm, I'm not sure I remember. So then Jesus explains the parable. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path. Here's the first dirt. Where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. The seed sits on the the hard pack and boom, it's gone. Second soil. Others like seed sown on rocky places Hear the word and at once receive it with joy. Now, I'm thinking about all of our students and kids at Hume Lake. 
that they're going to have the, the time of their lives and they're going to hear a message that is compelling and convicting and they're going to be so excited about Jesus. But it's possible that when they come home, because they don't have roots, as Jesus said, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. That's why we need to pray and support the follow-up and the encouragement of each one of these students as they come back from Hume. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And then the third dirt. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. As I've been contemplating this parable, this is the place that my mind and my heart kept coming back to as I think about the glut of information that you and I process every day. This seed sown among thorns that Jesus says are the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth. But here's the phrase, the desires for other things. Now, desires for other things are not necessarily bad. But it's when a good desire gets just twisted out of shape a bit, it becomes a disordered desire. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Where in the midst of the, of the, the, the anxiousness of life, the pace that we keep, the information that comes our way, navigating our identities on social media, that we can have our desires disordered and slowly slide away from the word that Jesus is sowing in our lives. And then finally, the fertile soil. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what is sold, sown. So I want to contemplate for a moment who this Jesus is that is sowing his word in our lives. Because Jesus is speaking. And I want to read three key passages that elevate the Savior of ours. The very beginning of the Gospel of John, John says this, in the beginning was the Word. Now, if you know the Bible, you know that that's how the Bible starts in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. And John picks up on that, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's giving identity to who Jesus is. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing that was made that has been made. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And you've heard people up here say often our vision statement that we're, we are committed and devoted to the words and ways of Jesus, because we believe he is the word of God made flesh. He's the incarnate God. So we are foundationally, fundamentally committed to the words that Jesus gives us. We want to be attentive and listen to him. Another passage, the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of Colossians, he says this about Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God. When you look at Jesus, you see God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him, in Jesus, all things were created. Just let that wash over if you for a moment. In Jesus, everything was created. The sand that we sit on and the ocean that we look at. He is the creator. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and get this, in him 
all things hold together. You want to know how the planets keep rotating? How the tides keep coming in and out? How our bodies continue to work even while we sleep? In him, all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. If we listen to anything, let Jesus be the one we listen to first. Don't let data drown him out. And then one last scripture in Hebrews chapter 1. The writer says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. You see that all through what we call the Old Testament, the ancient scriptures. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. See, there it is again, the creator. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. We've got to arrange our lives in a way that we hear Jesus speaking. In John 27, 10, 10, 27, Jesus said, "Uh, my sheep hear my voice. Now, when I hear that, it makes me realize that it is possible to hear Jesus speaking. My sheep hear my voice. Am I listening? Jesus is speaking. And he's the word of God made flesh. But in an increasingly noisy world, sometimes we discover that we just can't hear him. And maybe sometimes because we've forgotten to listen. We've just stopped listening to him. I promise you, he's the sower. He's sowing his words. Jesus said, it's possible to have a hard heart, and Satan will snatch the word away. It's possible to have a shallow heart and to accept the word, but because we don't have a root, It just withers away. And it's also possible to have a crowded heart, a heart that's just so full of stuff that his voice gets drowned out. And we want to have a fertile heart, a heart that hears, accepts his word, and it bears fruit. Being curious like the disciples. I want to know more. I want to understand. I want to receive that word. I want to hear it. I knew there was a quote out there. It's by Blaise Pascal. It's a compelling quote to me. He was a French philosopher and a Catholic theologian, and he said this, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. It's an interesting thought. Our inability to be completely quiet in a room by ourselves. And, And maybe you've tried that before. But with the advent of the internet in our pocket, there is hardly a moment where when we're standing someplace in line, we have a moment, we have a break, when we're bored, we pull out our phones. Literally hundreds of times in a day. And Blaise Pascal had no idea about the iPhone, but he identified this as a significant challenge for us that we're confronting in our world today. In fact, uh, uh, some researchers at UVA and Harvard did a study to see how people would deal with uh, the, the external world around them versus the internal world of their own thoughts. And they invited people to sit for 15 minutes in a room that was unadorned, had no, uh, nothing in it. They had no music, no books, no reading, no phone. Just sit for 15 minutes in this room. Now, prior to the study, they'd said, you do have an option of shocking yourself if you get too bored. 
and they let them experience the shock. And most of the people said, that is terrible. In fact, I'll even pay you money not to get shocked. So go and do the experiment, sit for 15 minutes in the room. 75% of the men found it so uncomfortable that they chose to shock themselves rather than sit quietly with their own thoughts. It's possible that our entire sense of self, this internal world where we need to be comfortable with who we are and who we're becoming, it, it's gotten drowned out because we're afraid to look inside. We can be in touch with everybody and everything but lose ourselves. In fact, this is not just a challenge of our mind processing all the emails and all the data. This is something that is connected to our soul, as Jesus says. His words can be snatched away and be unfruitful. The psalmist said in Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. And maybe one of the reasons why we often struggle with the reality of God is that we just don't take time to be still, to just be quiet in his presence. I want to read you a quote. I think it's a really powerful quote. So listen. <laughs> this is from Henry Nowen. And he's talking about Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted by the evil one. He was there for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days. That's a lot more than 15 minutes. Now it says this, solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. He calls it the false self. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he was tempted to take on a false self. And so are we. In fact, this is a different message, but the reality of social media for many has become the pursuit of an identity. And social media easily gives us a false, a false self. Now it goes on to say, in solitude, when Jesus was in the wilderness, he affirmed God as the only source of his identity. Solitude is the place of the great struggle and the great encounter. The great struggle and then the great encounter. The struggle against the compulsions of the false self. And the encounter with the loving God who offers himself as the substance of the new self. It's why we need to receive the word that Jesus gives and find our identity in what he says before we look all around us to the distractions. So I want to suggest a process. I've just been thinking this through. A, a process for dealing with data. A process for becoming fertile soil where the words of Jesus can be implanted and they can bear fruit. 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. Because that's really one of the reasons he put us on this earth is that we might bear fruit, that we might be productive as followers of Jesus in his kingdom. So we start with silence. And I acknowledge that getting silence in our noisy world is really, really hard. So... 40 days in the wilderness? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, 15 minutes? For some, that's going to be really hard. But maybe five minutes. Silence. Secondly, discernment. What am I hearing? Is it true? Is it false? Is it worth keeping? Is it worth paying attention to? Is it junk? Am I just, like, scrolling and just 
like an hour goes by and all I've done is looked at junk, discernment, and then third, selection. We have to select that which is important. That's that which we're hearing that is vital. And then intention. Hearing without intention is to become the word on the hard path and Satan just comes and takes it away. Listening without intention is just words. And then finally, practice or action. Putting it into action. James in 122, he said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So we have a moment of silence then discernment, then selection, then with intention, we put that which we're hearing into practice. And I want to encourage you that a, an important practice when you're listening to the words of Jesus is when you hear Jesus speaking to you through the scripture, through a podcast, through a sermon, through a book, through a conversation, when you, when you discern that this is something that is Jesus breaking through the noise, I find it really important to write it down, to find a way to write it down and then to come back and review it. What, what did God say to me this week? And review because the amount of data and noise that comes in our eyes and in our ears, it will, it will shove that out. It'll disappear. Haven't you had that experience where you think, I want to remember, but I just can't remember anymore. So I find the practice of journaling to be super helpful. And after reading, after listening, and not to be self-serving, but, but I, I would suggest that when we come and sit here on the beach and you hear a sermon, that you don't need to remember in fact, it's impossible to remember everything that one of us says. But listen with discernment for Jesus, and you may take out a nugget or two. Take that with you. Identify it. And then do what it says. Ask the question often like the disciples did with their curiosity. Jesus, what do you want to say to me? And then listen. Jesus, what do you want to say to me? And then listen. We become engaged listeners. We become engaged students. Wanting to hear Jesus, saying, Jesus, I expect you to speak to me, and I'm listening. In fact, we're going to do this right now. And I have, I'm going to invite us into a moment of silence. And um, Ron may be able to, with the battery pack here, uh, hook up something so you could get shocked if that's um, something that might make you feel better about this. We're going to take two minutes. And, and two minutes is a really long time. And um, we, we are sitting in a place with unbelievable distractions. So I encourage you, no phone, don't write anything, and I know um, the guys catching waves are going to be um, interesting, but maybe look to the horizon and the sky, and just see what it's like to just sit and be still. So I'm going to give you these two scriptures, and Brooke, you're going to time as Brooke will come up and lead us into communion at the end of the two minutes. In 1 Samuel 3, it says, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We start there. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God comes back and says, be still and know that I am God. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Be still and know that I am God.
Lord. As our two minutes is over, I pray that this would not be closing your word and moving on and now immediately jumping to the next thing that we need to think about. The thing that's coming after the service for us in our day, what we need to do next, but this would just be an open door to communication with you that would continue. I love what Bill said about arranging our lives in such a way that we would hear your voice. And we just, before you now, Lord, think about when is the last time we heard your voice? Can we, can we remember that moment? And if not, is it because the noise is too loud or because we're not listening? We just ask now, Lord, that you would reveal to us the reason, the thing that we might need to do, the step that we might need to take in order to better arrange our lives, that we might hear your voice. And if we did hear it, Lord, even this morning, I pray that you would lead us in the process that Bill described of discerning and selecting and setting intention and leading us to action, Lord. And maybe that feels overwhelming. So maybe there's just one, one step that we can practice today. I thank you so much, Jesus, that you are a God who allows us to hear your voice. <laughs> That's amazing and humbling. So we thank you and we love you and we just keep the door open to communication with you today. Amen. That wasn't so bad, was it? That gets me excited to just continue to do that. So thank you for joining. Um, we're going to close our service this morning with something that we practice as a church weekly, and that is partaking in communion together. And communion is the practice where we I mean, this is the reason that we're gathered. We remember and celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. So I want to read just a couple words from 1 Corinthians. This is Jesus. I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and gave thanks. And he distributed it to the disciples and said, Take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, This cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it. And whenever you drink this, do it and remember me. So we're just going to close and spend a few minutes together as a church. Here's the communion. You can come up when you're ready. And if you are eager to just get back to those two minutes, that was not enough for you. Just take it. Take that time right now. You won't regret it. And quiet yourselves. Continue to listen for the voice of the Lord. If you want to connect with someone, pray together. There's time for that too. Thank you for joining us and feel free after you've taken communion and done what you need to do to uh, just come back next week. All right.